I sat in John's beautiful farmhouse in beautiful Lincolnshire. It's a rural idyllic scene which is very amazing, Blondell. Welcome, John, Eddie, and Terry. Thank you, my Hi. Hi. Right, amazing Blondell. Uh, the actual name <laughs> was the guy who got the gig for Richard Lionheart, is that right? That's right, yes. Can you tell me how yeah. you came across that? Well, um, I think it was only probably out around once. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon and noon and night. Mm. What, what, what happened was, um, as you know, Blondell was supposed to have written a lot of songs with Richard Lionheart. They were sort of like the Lennon and McCartney of their day. Uh -huh. And uh, just at the original inception of Amazing Blondell, I'd gone up somewhere to Middlesbrough, I think it was, and there's a guy called Eugene McCoy who's, who's a Quite, he's quite a well-known chef, or he was anyway. He still is. Is he? Oh, I saw right, him on okay. television yeah. um, last week. All oh, right. Well, there you are. And uh, at the time, my 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 girlfriend was uh, lived for, up there, and uh, I was playing a couple of new songs to him, and he said, "Oh, very Blondell." So that's and we thought, great idea. And the amazing bit came because record companies wanted something that an adjective, an adjective to parallel the incredible string band. You see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm because they were on the go at the time. Yeah. But you guys were always different because, you know, around that time everybody was looking to America and Amer anything American was cool, etc. And I, I read somewhere, I think it's a quote by you, Jean, that you didn't want to follow America culturally. We could sing about cod pieces, not Cadillacs. <laughs> well, yeah, I think something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the thing is, um, Really, it's been borne out, hasn't it? Because I mean, when the when the punk era started, I mean, everybody was singing with a London accent, weren't they? You know, an East End accent. So I mean, why not yeah. sing from the country that you you emanate from? All right, all right. And let's go back about five years before Amazing Blondell was formed in 1970, and basically talking about all your influences, because initially you were part of, you did want to be a rock band, mm. rock musicians. Is that right? We still do. <laughs> <laughs> We're just bringing things up to date bit by bit. So I think in another 15 years, we should be around to the 50s. Yes. But we'll get there eventually. Right. And we'll also outlive most of our critics. So, so we might actually get an album sale of some. So you've got like a 500 year time warp. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. right yeah. Trying very hard to yeah. catch up. Right. It's caught in a vortex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a bit like the Blackadder series. <laughs> But your first band, real band, was the Dimples, yeah? Well, we, we actually, the Dimples and Ed's band, uh, we were sort of rival bands, weren't we, Ed? In Scunthorpe. <coughs> yeah, in Scunthorpe, that's right. It's all Scunthorpe. It's all Scunthorpe, yeah. It's mid-60s. Yeah, Ed and I were born, both of us were born in Scunthorpe. Yeah, right. And Terry was born, where were you born, Ted? Portsmouth. Portsmouth. It was a lesser known, as you get, undiscovered country. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Ted and I met at school. We started a school band, and then when we mm. when we left, we 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 we, we stuck started, together. Yes, and started got a couple of other guys in the Scunthorpe and started a little mm. four piece. Right. And um, that Ed, was the dimples. That was the dimples. Yeah, the right. usual thing, weren't we? Two guitars, bass player, and drums. That's that's, that's right. it uh, initially. And the lineup. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And Ed's Ed's band was called the Kingpins, wasn't it? It was that and lots of other things. Crap was the They actually had the distinction. I've got to say this, yeah, the distinction of, tell me, tell me, what is the, the nickname for if somebody makes a mistake in a band, what do you call it? Scocker. No, 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 no. There's a, there's a another name, just a one word name. Can you, have you ever heard anybody call something a Rick? No. Oh. oh, it's well, in the north of England, all over the north of England, it's a well used word, or it used to be. Mm. And it actually comes from our bass player at the time, Rick. Right. And, uh, no, so well, because he couldn't play. He couldn't play at all. He was actually t tone deaf. And I know that people say that that particular ailment doesn't exist, but yeah. mm. maybe not for everybody else. But believe me, it's there with mm. Rick. And we used to do a sound check, and then I used to turn him down, <laughs> like altogether. And he never knew. So then he was just deaf. And then it was called cool for any mistake. He called it a Rick. Right. After, after so they actually came to see us. What was laughingly called rehearsing. Right. At a, a church, um, what called church hall? Church halls. Mm. Mm. So I'm going <laughs> um, with the idea, with the intent of pinching 
our bass player now. Oh, come on. No. Thing. No, that's it. That, 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 that You want to take him off me and let him to play? I'll tell you I'll tell you something. If we were if we were at your bass well, why are you it wouldn't be called head hunting, it'd be <laughs> arse hunting. <laughs> I could, I've never seen two people so happy when they saw him playing, and then they just left. <laughs> I thought, well, we'll better have the other idiot instead. Then. No, I think it'd be probably, there used to be in Scantalk in those days, there'd be a thing called the beat contest, it was called, right. that, and all the bands were going for the beat contest, you see. So before this, a month or two before this, bands would go to other bands' performances just to see what the competition was like and how good they were or, or otherwise. And so. take them outside and beat them and then <laughs> carry on. There wasn't any really, was there? But you, you, you're very modest because in fact the dimples did move forward very, very quickly. I mean, so Don Arden got to hear of you. And you <laughs> <laughs> we're and still and on the run now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what's it like being dangled out of a window? Uh, well, it's not too bad with both legs being held, but with one, it's pretty scary. <laughs> By what? But how did that happen? Scunthorpe Band well, suddenly leads to Don Arden. We, we had good jackets. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. The three quarter jackets. Yeah, so we, we had some jackets made up. Right, so right. There was sort of, actually, it must have been a, a, a precursor or a portent of what we did in later on in Mason Blondell because we had these jackets designed to look like sort of like a Regency jacket. That's right. Didn't yeah. we? And um, mm. we, uh, we... How come mine was checked or tartan? No, they were all checked. Oh, were they? Yeah. yeah. And, and what happened was we saw an advert in the, in the NME saying, do you want a recording contract? Come to play at this gig. Uh, auditions so it was, a, it was a Romford Town Hall right. and we, we went down there did this audition and there were about 10 bands on it and really the place was packed which was obviously a way for them to get all, all, all these people in paying paying an entry charge and just not having to pay the band mm. anyway we didn't hear anything but for some reason or other we'd stayed sort of down for two nights and so we rang them on Monday and said yeah come into the office and they signed us up Wow. Didn't say anything on the night. And what what kind of numbers were you playing there? Oh, all sort of um, there'd be there'd be sort of Motown type covers, you know that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, may we maybe have one or two of our own bits of material, mm -hmm. but we're basically mainly soul Motown. Yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, um, and suddenly, also, you had a record deal. But wasn't it Gospel Garden we're talking about? No. Head. No. No. Now, have you taken your the dementia <laughs> pills today? I think no, probably no. not. I thought we were moving a bit fast, a bit too quick. No, 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 no. All right, okay. He's first. got the notes. That's all right. Okay, we, 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 we were do, we were doing stuff. I, I know what you mean about gospel garden, but we were doing sort of temptations covers and stuff. Were like we that. Yeah, yeah, impulse? yeah, we were trying to. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, actually, the well, love of the lifetime. That was the single. Yeah, because if yeah. you remember. Oh right, yeah, because the, uh, that would be. I, right I, I the, then moved on to material, being singer. Yeah. We got another lead guitarist in then, you see. Right. Um. But what Ted said about his jacket was absolutely true. And one other thing that he hasn't told you, he was the first person to ever wear square trousers. They were square. They hung like boxes on your legs. Yeah, four, four sewn increases, so it looked like a square. You know, fantastic. I mean, what a trendsetter. Yeah. I mean, imagine, yeah. what, imagine why it didn't catch on at all. Can you? <laughs> Beyond me. I mean, if you think they'd all go for it, wouldn't you? Square yeah. trousers in a check bad, jacket it's, it's going down all those materials. The band cool. goes down, audition, record deal. This is what, you know, a lot of bands try very yeah. a long time to achieve. Oh, we, you know, we, you're we being very sort of uh, well, well, we matter of fact about to it. To say that he's actually, we're like, there's a, what he said was there's a contract out on you now. <laughs> <laughs> you want a contract. We actually did that sort of t dragging a tape recorder around yeah, um, yeah. Tin Pan Alley, yeah, we Denmark did. Street. Yeah. You did go through that. We, we, we did all that yeah. and, right. and slept on the, or well, changed in the railway station. In the I morning, remember sleeping we? in the van and, 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 and drinking the condensation. And you wrote the B-side to that yourselves, didn't you? That was, that was your song? Uh, was yeah. Your, yeah on so, the, so you were already writing your own material? We, we, well. we talk about, yeah, My Heart is Tied to You, that was B-side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So you were already sort of thinking in terms of your own material. Were you two like a duo, a songwriting duo at that point? No. No? no, just John, you and just John, John you and was a songwriter. Right. I was learning to play at the time too. And write as well. <laughs> we and write. trying in fact to learn how to iron <laughs> box trousers. <laughs> 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 no, yeah. yeah. And it, then the next the interesting thing in the history of the Dimples, whilst we're still on about that, is that you actually turned down Hi Ho Silver Lining. We as did, a, yeah. As a possible yeah. single. 
So is, does that mean that when you heard the demo of it, it sounded like a, an unremarkable song? No, no, I don't think that. It was just we didn't think it was really our scene. And um, I mean, it, it sounds like a bad move, but the Don Arden had another band called The Attack at the time. And when we turned it down, they did it. And I mean, Jeff Beck's... Jeff Beck swept the floor, you see. I mean, the attacks version didn't get anywhere. What do you mean after he'd released it, he swept the floor? So <laughs> Jeff Beck couldn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> that solo is a dreadful solo, isn't it? <laughs> Yours, <What>? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine is here, crap. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, Jeff Beck did a, did a good job yeah, on it and, yeah. and everything, but and but I don't think <clears throat> I don't think it would have it would have really turned a hair. Well, for you. No, yeah. no, but, well, because if we were we're an unknown band, Jeff Beck wasn't, mm -hmm. and uh, so. If it was going to do any good, the attack would have made it happen. Mm -hmm. Eddie, what were you doing during this time when your rivals had made it, got a deal, all the rest of it? I was working on a newspaper right. as a trainee photographer and feeling sick as a parrot because they were out there giving it large, as the saying in modern <laughs> parlance. Mm. And I was working and it just didn't seem fair. So, I quit. Thought, I'm not having it. <laughs> if I can just sit at home and strum my guitar and starve, then I will. And that's what you did? That's what I did, yeah. And then the these, the well, then these guys rescued me. It was funny, really, you know. But just but before that, there was Gospel Garden, wasn't there? If we just yeah, there was. Sort of go to that just one other thing as well, I don't know if you know, but the guy who produced Love of a Lifetime was Tony Clark, who went on to be the Moody Blues producer. Was it? Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, you see, I'm a man of information. <laughs> and the dead falls fell apart. And no, it no, didn't really fall apart. We actually renamed ourselves Gospel oh, right, Garden. Right. Yeah. Mm. So it was the same four four guys, and you became Gospel Garden. No, five of us were five. five right. Yeah, f f five. But when we start off as four in the dimples, then when, when we got the recording deal with with Don Arden right. um, yeah. and Decker, that was there were five of us then. Mm. Keyboards or no, no, no. I I just went on to lead singing, oh, and right. we got we got a, a lead guitarist who could play because I was yeah. crap at lead guitar. So, mm. right. um, uh, so. Um, but then I gather the lead guitarist did nothing but play and mm. play far oh, too loud. Oh no, 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 no that was the, that was the next one. Right. The guy who who was in then, I mean, he who started in, in his, with the dimples. He was a very good lead guitarist and mm. got a good mm. stage, good good stage mm. balance ideas and everything. Mm -hmm. But when we got onto Methuselah, that was a late. We sort of went through about three different lead guitarists and. Right. But we're jumping. The, we we sort of leapfrogging mm. the right. the right. gospel garden. Right. And Gospel Garden, how long did that last about? I don't know, I guess it was... 18 months? 18 months, something, and then we went on to, to Matthews. Yeah, it, it, Dave D was your sponsor, wasn't he? The famous Dave D. What happened was, we, we played um, a gig in Redford, of all places. It was like a little package to a thing, but we were co-opted co to play as one of the mm. supports. Dave D was headlining. Mm -hmm. And after the, after the gig, he came into the dressing room and said, um, have you got, guys got a record deal? Because I'm just getting into producing. And so um, we said, well, Miss World. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was getting to Miss World. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was an in joke at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, uh, the, 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 the thing with, um, with Don Arden's lot fell through after that single. If, you know, they weren't going to stay with us if we hadn't made it a hit. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we, we hadn't got a deal. So um, we said, well, yeah, we're looking for one. And then I think I forget what. Polydor Camp. Was that the one? Yeah. It, yes. It, camp label. Yeah. Camp. It, yes, it was. Yeah, that was the, the um, Finders Keepers, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we we went down, got introduced to Steve Rowland, and then um, he and the guy who was his business partner then had a, a production company called Double R Productions, which um, to start with, I think Dave D was. Um, in, into produ producing, but I think we ended up getting Steve Rowan producing us oh, for that single. I think he acted more as an A and R, really. Yeah. Oh. And, and, and then how did Methuselah come about? Must just say about Gospel Garden, it yeah. was the band that we all learned to dance in, isn't it? Because we used to do, you know, oh, instead of stage routine. and yeah. set routines and right. things like that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Bunch of fairies. <laughs> <laughs>
It's also where we all there was learned, a ballet. No, we, was we, a we, sugar I want ballet. No. Oh God! <laughs> it's also where we learned to sing, isn't it? Really, learned the harmony. Well, I think we started, doing, we it we started doing more harmonies than that. Yeah, but right, uh, the harmony work came out of that. And then later in 1968, Methuselah came about, yeah? Yeah, I mean, um, we, we recognised that at the time we sort of drifted with the trends, I guess, and, and we found, you know, pro progressive rock was coming on, family. The blues boom was well, in its heyday, yeah, but the, jamming like, and jazz rock and that. All the Chrysalis bands were coming, you know, yeah. um, I mean, there was, um, there was family, they were, and, and everybody was sort of raving about them. Mm. And then we used to get some of, there was a, there was a place called the Jazz Workshop, that in Scunthorpe, where most bands cut their teeth, and then that moved to a, a different venue. And um, what happened was, they, we, they couldn't afford the big Chrysalis bands, but they used to get some of the lesser known Chrysalis bands. I mean, and they're really, they're really good. I'll tell you who we had there, I say we had, that the, the promoter had, John Evans Smash, which was later Jethro Tull. Mm -hmm. And Ian Anderson was, was uh, playing with them, and. Um, and I mean, they're, they're all good bands, and you knew if there's a Chrysalis band coming along. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody seemed to be wanting. wanting. So we thought, well, we'd better change our style a bit. So we, right. we moved away from the, um, the, the sort of uh, soul, Tamla mm -hmm. impression sort well, of stuff. a bit of bubblegum, I understand. But Polydor <laughs> want you to do some bubblegum music as well. Oh, uh, well, no, I mean, I mean Polydor, mm -hmm. um, with, with, with that, that, that was really, gospel garden they kept trying to shunt us into commercial mm -hmm. stuff and we really didn't want to be there mm -hmm. and so when when we became um uh methuselah we, we did all our own material then mm -hmm. and which was a bit risky really because we had to go to gigs and you would be playing nobody's covers mm -hmm. um and uh, you were exposed oh, yeah that's right and um mm -hmm. uh, and then um the uh steve rollins and his partner got Jack Holtzman in, interested from Elektra mm -hmm. and we did two albums for Elektra. One got released and bombed it because it, was, it wasn't very good mm -hmm. and the second one actually was quite good but then but that never came came out I don't know right. what's happened to that. Right. Right. <laughs> Unlike the turn of events for two records, one was rubbish and got released, <laughs> the other one was great and right. never got that. <laughs> 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 so in in, in an indirect way though that band was the beginning of Amazing Blondell and the whole approach, but because as I understand it, you had it was very, very loud. You had a, yeah. a lead guitarist by that time in Methuselah who was like over riffing, over mm. playing the whole time. Mm. A lot of uh, volume, a lot of self indulgence. There was a drummer with a double drum kit, was that, yeah. The, the, all that kind of late 60s over indulgence. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we, it was from that that the seeds of an amazing one it came, came out of frustration. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I mean, the thing is, we, we wanted yeah. to be loud, but the problem was that. Out of, equipment doesn't didn't match it. No, out songs, of all the it? bands we played with in that up until that era, the only band I ever saw who were loud and you could hear what they were singing about was the Who. And so I don't know what because their PA didn't look. At, do you remember when we played yeah. with them at yeah. Back? Their PA didn't look that much bigger mm. than anybody else's. I think there were two Marshall comms at either side, but it was just they must have souped it up something mm. rotten because that it just worked. It because yeah. it was bloody good and yeah. uh, and of course we all wanted to be loud, but we but. The PAs just couldn't seem to hack it. There, there also wasn't much fold back in those days. There was yeah. no fold back. I think uh, we, didn't have, we never knew. Everything was just thrash, wasn't it? A monitor was exactly. something that collected exactly. your plates. <laughs> <laughs> I think just on, on that point that, um, that uh, basically uh, the Who did manage to get Charlie Watkins at Wem to build them this, this fabulous very very loud PA at one point so they, they, yeah. they were ahead of the game well that is true so but but when we we played with them as a dimples at, at an open air football thing and, they, they, and there was a what I think it was a Watkins PA that everybody was using mm -hmm. and then the who came on it was a box PA they hoofed it and put their own Marshall PA on All right. and uh, and I mean it was you know it was, something else. It was a business yeah right, mm -hmm. right. But it was this loudness that led to Amazing Blondell mm. because you looked out on the audience, so the legend goes, mm. and when you were thrashing them with these decibels, you took pity on them. <laughs> you two took pity on them and said, perhaps an acoustic number in the midst of all this. Yeah. Can I just interrupt? You've got that word wrong, Ed. Well, <laughs> it's not legend, is it? I wasn't even no, it's, no, it's not legend, though, is it? What's well, legend? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. T tell the story about your mother. <laughs> Well, I, well, which one? About my mother? Yeah. 
Well, the legend of Jesse James that was on the, <laughs> on the TV, in the newspaper. My uncle said, what's on TV? She said, the legend of Jesse James. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Sorry, sorry. Right. We, 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 That's so why my lyrics are a little strange. <laughs> 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 well, it's not dyslexia, it's called stupidity. So you, you got the idea for what today will be called Unplug. Yeah, that's it. But what, what happened was we, we thought, you know, we got the set, we did one set and we got no relief in it. So we thought, get a bit of contrast, we'd do an acoustic yeah. number. So Terry and I did an acoustic number. And we, we, we sort of, after a few gigs, we, we found out that it, we're getting more applause for that than mm, really? what we're doing with the, with the band. With the band. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't take too much to put two and two together. Yeah. Was it your own song? <laughs> yeah, it was one of our own songs. And, uh, Terry so they didn't know it? They didn't know the song? No, they didn't, they didn't know it. Okay. We didn't. No, <laughs> 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 we did. Uh, yeah, oh, Terry yeah. played bongos. I'm marrying your dexterity, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they were doing. Show them how you play bongos. Too. And, yeah, uh, so it's bongos and guitar yeah, and singing. Yeah, I played a 12 string and, right. and, um, and um, Ted uh, bongos and we both sang. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it started going down fairly well. And we were, we were struggling trying to get gigs for the mm. band. It was difficult, you know, the, yeah. the personnel sort of, problems as well. Yeah, yeah the p places we were going, you, you really need to be in the college circuit and we didn't have an agent that got enough Personalities. Yeah, yeah, personality problems. <laughs> Didn't have one, and, um, and and then unfortunately the lead guitarist, bless him. He was, I mean, he's a very good guitarist, but he just wanted wanted the people down the block to know that he was. And mm -hmm. So um, I mean, we just whatever we did, it'd start off. We get a balance, and we'd start off, and gradually by about song number four, everything was just drowned out by the mm -hmm. by the, the lead mm -hmm. player. Mm -hmm. So. Your bongos, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so we, we 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 decided we were going to leave the band and s set off on our own. Right. right. Which we did. Which was unfortunate, really, because it didn't go down very well. Because um, you had a deal at that time from Bell, didn't you? No, we were with, that 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 was with Electra. Um, right. Um, mm. That was and the, that's still the, going, the right? Methuselah days. Mm. Yeah, we did one album which got released in America only, which bombed. Right. And then, and that we had the, the second album we did, uh, it never got released. Right. And um, then after that, we, you see, we're still locked into this this management, uh, sorry, production company mm -hmm. um, thing with uh, Steve Rowland and his and his partner. Mm -hmm. And um, so they got you into the folk clubs, did they? Or no, 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 no. They, they, um, we, we just said we weren't doing Matthews anymore. We start. I started ringing around getting. Folk club gigs right. and and ring a few colleges and said, "Will you take us?" Had you got the magic name by then? Um, I no. think we no, we no. had. Have we? Yeah, we had got the name. We didn't do any gigs without without the name Blondell. Right. right. But fortunately, I, I've made a few contacts. So I just rang rang them and said, "Look, we'll come and play for you." And of course, two guys playing with just a, a couple of acoustic guitars and a PA was a lot cheaper. For them to book than a five-piece rock band with right. two or three roadies, so yeah. so we, we could we found that we could get into places easier, right. and um, so uh, you know we, we did a few of these gigs and right. things start to happen and then uh, and at this point Eddie Baird well no 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 he's not come yet no I answered no, he yes <laughs> no he, he, he hasn't come what, out of his place what, what have you been doing in the meanwhile not not that not, not that for I was working I was still working <laughs> you know day in day out. Six days a week, you know, relentless. Right. He's got a fanning around, <laughs> sacking people, playing yeah. with his bongos, and I'm there at eight o'clock on the dock in a He's dark room, late. going right. at eight o'clock to work in the dark all day in a dark room, going home at night when it's dark. I was as white as that wall. I was. Actually, Ed, Ed, Ed was. Uh, white as that it, wall. It, 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 it was peculiar, really, because uh, we. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what. What happened first? I think we played we played a folk club up in Sunderland, mm -hmm. we, and we, we and it was a, a traditional folk club, and the, and I, I badgered the guy to, to give us a gig for ages, and he, he said, oh no, you'll go down badly, you know, if you're playing your own stuff, because we just did our own stuff, and went up there anyway. And <coughs> the short of it was we, we we went there really well, and a little guy came up after after we'd finished playing, he being one of the floor singers, he's only about sixteen, and said, hey, I want to join your group. He sort of prodded us like, hey, I want to join your group. He said, piss off. And he kept on. And, um, and anyway, 
the next time I went up there, he was there. And um, we sort of put him off. And that, that was Dave Stewart from Eurythmics. And he used to, he used to bunk in the, the, the van with the roadies. And, and, mm. But then we asked Ed to join us. Right. I um, wish you'd have told me to piss off. I've got a bit more money now. I've been playing with Dave Stewart. God, Dave rings him up. I says, see, I bet you regret it now. <laughs> <laughs> just for the real Blondell followers, how, how long was that sort of period as just the two of you? Can, how, not, you not, that, it? not that long. Weeks, months? Well, it was long enough to do the album. Yeah, we did the it? first album, which, which was on Bell. Bell right. And that, that yeah, was, again, Bell through Bell. through the, the, the production company that Steve Rome ran. Right. And then... Um, and the brass on it, and it was a bit, yeah. a bit and, rockier and than... Yeah. It was Big Jim Sullivan on there. Yeah, Big Jim Sullivan did all the arrangements did all the arrangements but he right. did also all this guitar playing he could play really fast yeah. Yeah. and then we found out that Ed could play really fast as well anyway. yeah I forget how we we yeah. we saw we saw it at the folk or something he was doing a, a little duo yeah. right. um, with another guy <clears throat> and uh, you know they were really good and mm. so we we said do, do you fancy a full-time gig so the other guy was out of work immediately. He's got this <laughs> reputation of putting more people out of work than the BSC. Redundancy. Redem yeah. But, but in actual fact, that when we first started augmenting Blondell, it, we weren't necessarily thinking of it being permanent because what we did, we also got a cello player. <laughs> and um, and uh, we, we still lasted about an afternoon, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, but then we got, we got old Richard, didn't we? Yeah, yeah we well, found he couldn't yeah. take the pressure, could he? No. Uh, and we did this tour of the West Country. Um, and so there was Ter Terry and I, Ed, and a guy playing cello, you see. Right. And we called it Amazing Blondell and Broken Consort, because Broken Consort was sort of the description for, if you like, the, 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 the rock band of the 1600s. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, we went down, did these gigs down the West Country, and we finished the last one. Uh, I think <coughs> the last one was at Maidenhead. We came home, got home about, got to Lincoln about five in the morning. The cello player got out of the van. To, to stop at the shop to get a, a bottle of milk or something, passed out on, <laughs> on the pavement, hit his head with a hell of a crack. That was the last gig he ever did. And uh, we, we thought, well, he's not going to last. Right. <laughs> it's a pity because that would have been really entertaining, wouldn't it, every night? To, <laughs> just drive around till he gets tired, send him to shop and watch him <laughs> fall over a lot. Yeah. So then, then it was three, then it was Amazing Blondell. That's right, yeah. yeah we asked that was 1969, asked, wasn't it? Yeah, we asked Ed so. to join permanently then. Right, and, um, and then the next big crossroads for you, because you, you, I think there's a lot of luck in this. Video, there's a lot of luck, yeah. In, in, yeah. in this band, because you know names like Dave D, for what is Don Arden, <laughs> etc. And the next name, you were supporting Free in Hull, yeah, on an autumn evening, yeah. uh, as as Amazing Blondell, the three piece. No, it was a, it was just two of us. All right. But what we were at the time rehearsing Eddie into yeah. the repertoire, oh, right. Right. and um, we played this this gig. Uh, you know, with free, right. um, mm. and uh, afterwards, Andy Fraser came in and said, um, mm. "Yeah, have you got a deal?" Uh, and we said, "Well, we don't do drugs." <laughs> 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 no, we said, uh, "We said uh, still not funny, is it?" No, <laughs> it's not funny at all. Um, we said that uh, we, we had, but we weren't really happy with it, which was which is the truth of the matter. We, things had been going wrong with um, this production company that we were with, and so. They said, well, we'll have a word with Ireland. So we thought, well, that'd be good. And then we, we didn't hear anything. And then uh, suddenly out of the blue, we got a phone call saying, come down, see Chris Blackwell. And Have I actually done a gig with you at this point? I, 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 I don't I, I think that the first time I played was in Blackwell's office. Yeah, was I, it, think it, it? I think it was, because yeah. we did. Yeah. That must have been. Yeah, yeah. 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 Up, up in the penthouse at the yeah. top. Yeah, because yeah. I can't remember. Because all we did was sit on the floor and play to, we, to play. We went to... We went literally to, did a live audition. We yeah, went we just, to, well, he didn't want us to do one, did he? No, he, 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 had, he hadn't expected us to do one. He's, he was just going to sign us. And so we, we to play? <laughs> and what we thought we'd have to play, you see, because we were, we were a bit green. So we, mm. we, we went up there with, our, with the, the lutes and stuff and sat down and uh, played in, I think, spring season. I can't remember what it was. It was spring season. And he just. I, I played the. Um, you sit played sit in, yeah. Sit in. Yeah. And uh, he just said, right. Um, Great. What, what advance do you want? And I mean, we, we weren't prepared to get at out all. of my life forever. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had not done our homework at all. We had no idea. Right. And so we all sort of looked, it went quiet. We, thought, <laughs> we need a PA, a van. So yeah. we looked at it that way. We just, way. Yeah, we didn't sort of look at, now we, we want to keep a subsistent level yeah. amount yeah. of earnings for the next three years or whatever. We didn't right. do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
In fact, it was only the diarrhoea that's actually made a sound at all, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Petrified or what? So now, now it's 1969, and you, you've, you've got the what everybody that was doing kind of alternative music, you call yeah. it today, would dream of. You, you've got to deal with Island mm. Records. Mm. What was your next thought, you know, in terms of what kind of music are you going to put on this first album, the crucial first album? Well, well we got, we were performing, we got most of it performing, we were rehearsing it, you know, once Ed came in, it gave us so much more scope because, I mean, Ed was, got great, I mean, I will say to Ed that if he hadn't have played with us, he, and he'd have, he could have been a, a really first rate classical guitarist because he, he got the speed and, the, and, and all the, the way Dexterity. with it. Dexterity. And I've still been in that dark room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know it, it was good because it gave us a lot more scope we could you know work more adventurously mm. and um, ideas flowed as well yeah. once, once we got together but where where did the sort of is it because of Ed joining you're already into this uh, let's call it the Robin Hood <laughs> old England thing <clears throat> But for, Ed, for five Ed, years in the 60s you, you were like many other bands you, yeah. just, you were following the trend where did you suddenly, you know, there was that gig where the unplugged section mm. worked, but then, then you really did go for this medieval England. Well, it just seemed to be organic, didn't it? Yeah, it, 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 it just it, seemed it, what uh, we all wanted to do at the time. And Ed right? was doing very similar things, yeah. weren't you? I mean, mm. the things that, that Ed was writing at that time were very, very similar. It was me right. that was sending you all them demos. Was it you? Was it? Yeah. Picture your ideas. Of the, the I have a shitey lining, I wrote that. <laughs> I but but you, you did study this, uh, call it a archaic music, you know, William Byrd has been mentioned, and you, you did know composers that were sort of, you know, it wasn't just, just I love, at music, speaking was personally, it? I only took a little look at it, but I bought mm. a few records just to get the flavour mm. of what we were doing, because mm. we didn't want to copy anybody, mm. right. because there was nobody to copy anyway, so we just, I right. got the flavour of it yeah. and pressed on, you know. Yeah. And I, I read somewhere that Elton Hayes was a hero. Well, he, the he was the guy. He, he had a lot of influence, actually, on, the, on, on modern music because, I mean, Elton John got his first name from Elton Hayes. I didn't know that. Yeah, he did, that's right. And, and Melvin Hayes got his first name. Melvin was a bit of a... <laughs> Elton Hayes was the guitar player in the Richard Green Rock He was, and he, series, he yeah. sang all the little fills in between, you know. Yeah. The and, and Willow Wood reminds me of that kind of approach. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, th I just thought, I thought that was how that sort of music sounded. So then I started listening to Julian Bream and the Julian Bream Consort and David Monroe, and I found out that there was a bit more to it than that. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, that is the public's, like you said, that is the public's Im mm -hmm. Im 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 impression of, of that sort of period of music. So right. we sort of built on that. Right. And and uh, and extended it. Right. And even song was the first release that encapsulated three, all the three of us. Yeah. 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 How did you enjoy recording that? You were in a fabulous studio, weren't you? Yeah. It, it was great. I mean, we really, we, I think, uh, from my point of view, I think it, it took me a couple of albums to really get into a, a recording technique. I wasn't very, very au fait with it. Um, right. I'd never been in one before. Really? So no, that was so my first. The first studio was Basing Street Studios, yeah. Island Studios. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Which is quite impressive because we went to the big studio. Quite daunting, I think. Mm. Was it? Yeah. Well, it the big studio. <laughs> would, the, the big studio would hold an orchestra, wouldn't it? Mm. It, it, well, it, it did. It was a big. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a big studio. I, yeah. I mean, and at the time, it would be state of the art, I think, wouldn't yeah. it? I mean, I just kept my head down and got on with what I was supposed to do because I thought, right. well, you know, there are times in life when you'd better keep your gob shut, and this is yeah. one of them. <laughs> And but I you must have worked of, very, very hard because they're, they're very intricate arrangements. I mean, so it must have, it must have taken. We were a lot. practiced up. We were. Yeah, yeah we, we did. We, we used to spend every day <coughs> practicing. Yeah, we, we a long time yeah. every day. I would have thought. Too. Yeah, yeah, we did. We, we did a lot of work on it. Mm. But funnily enough, we were talking about this the other day. We didn't have to do that much work. The hanging around was waiting for people to learn how to record what the instruments we had, because mm -hmm. they didn't even know what they were. Right. They just plug people in and let them turn up. What well, instruments were particularly difficult to record? Well, a, a, any nylon string acoustic instrument, if, I mean, if people haven't done it before, mm. they'll spend all day trying to get a sound of it because, well, what we found, you definitely need two mics and at different positions and different types of mics as well. And you've really got to experiment with the instrument. And they have no projection, these. Because they weren't real instruments, no. actually. They were more decorative than anything yeah, else. Quite right, that's right. Yeah. So they're not like a classical guitar would throw it out. Yeah. So yeah. every time they turned it up, you just go... Right. 
I thought it took ages for him to get that. So everybody was learning, really, weren't mm. they? Yes, yeah. And li listening to the three classic Ireland albums, one after the other, uh, Fantasia, Lindum, and England, there's one thing that comes through what we are just talking about there is that the vocal harmonies, mm. the production of them, is, is a lot stronger. Do you agree that as those albums progress, the, the vocals seem to almost uh, take up more space? It's yeah, I mean, my, my own personal view is I think we'd, we'd reached a, po a position when we recorded England where we really knew what we were doing in the studio. Uh, I mean, I just felt that. I, I felt that. I felt we knew how to get the right sound vocally and, and uh, instrumentally. But possibly some of some of our more sort of um, accessible songs were on the earlier albums. Mm. But but I mean, it was. It was a shame, really, because because from England, I I, I was really just getting into recording. Mm. And I really enjoyed. We doing just didn't them. know what we were capable of doing. Yeah. Also, yeah. Vocal, also, also, yeah, because yeah. 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 the vocal harmonies on, on England are really sort of very mm. very strong yeah. indeed. Yeah. Added added to the orchestra. But you see, as well. but you see, what happened? We we produced that ourselves, but we couldn't have done it without Phil Brown, who mm. who was who was the engineer on uh, Fantasia Linden, mm -hmm. and Phil from his experience on Fantasia Linden got really got into and understood how to work with our, our guitars for a start, well, or lutes. I mean, Fantasia, we had the old lutes on, but the England, we had the classical guitars, but he was, he was clued up then, he knew what to look for, and mm -hmm. I mean, he got a great sound, you know, right. on everything. Right. He knew how to deal with the voices as well. Right. And this, is the, this period is 1970 to 1972, yeah. Two very, very condensed years because you're gigging like mad as well, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Touring all yeah. over the place. Ireland, we were talking earlier, Ireland did push you very hard on the road. I mean, we didn't mind that. We, we, we enjoyed doing gigs. Mm. We, lo we loved it. You know, mm. we, 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 we really did enjoy it. It was, it was what we were there for. It was good for me because I actually had nowhere to live. So it was really quite handy being in the studio and on the road. And I'd come home and they'd say, I'll see you in a couple of days. And I'd think, well, what am I supposed to do? Stand here. <laughs> um, well, I live. I haven't got a house. And you forget, don't you, yeah. when you're that busy. Yeah. yeah. So I went back to my dark room, broke in, <laughs> and uh, stood there for two days waiting for him to come and get me. But then, unfortunately, um, after the American tour, the, the pressure of touring, suddenly, John, you have had enough. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it was a shame, really. I mean, th th there'd been a lot of things happening, and uh, I just came home from the tour, to a pile of mail, a divorce, and um, mm. what have you, and uh, and then we suddenly got this call from Ireland artist saying you're going to Frankfurt on next Tuesday, and we'd only been home a couple of days, and uh, and that was to do what? Well, to to tour with Spooky Tooth. We're due to go to America right. a fortnight after we returned from the first American tour, mm. which we were prepared for. But in this was your headlining tour. Yes, you you, you were. No, we we're going to be supporting traffic. Traffic, yeah. yeah, and you were also supporting Free a long, a, a long time, weren't you? Oh yeah, we did. We went out on the road with Free quite mm. a few times, but in yeah, the UK, yeah. um, we didn't do anything abroad with them. Right, right. But um, but the uh, the traffic tour was all set up, and then they they were actually traffic was starting in in Germany with Spooky Tooth supporting, and Spooky Tooth um, broke up, and so they suddenly wanted to ram us in as a last minute support, and right. I I really didn't feel I could cope with it with, you know, everything that I got on. Right. We were a fill-in for Spooky too. That's mm. right. Mm. Fill-in for Spooky Come on, keep on. It's a dentist <laughs> joke. <laughs> so, so this must have been <coughs> Trauma City for you. It must have been for the band. Well, so it was. You just got to the point where you're happy in the studio, yeah. and things are sort of really going for you, and suddenly you're losing singer-songwriter. Yeah, I mean, it's all... Um, a bit of a whirlwind load of nonsense, wasn't it? Because I think we, think we went and did the gig. We did, we you did, and I, I, yeah, me and Terry went and did the gig. Yeah, well, the was, spooky tooth gig, yeah. Uh, in Amsterdam, uh, it was a nightmare. We should never attempt We should it. never attempt No, we again. shouldn't. Mm. But it seems that they can just get that mad sometimes that you, you know, you don't know why you're doing things. Mm. You, you, because you don't just get enough time off to get your head together, as mm. they say. But Chris Blackhall was there. He was actually at, at the gig, and then he came into the, the dressing room after our five songs, I think we did, and he just said, <coughs> I think you better come off the road for six yeah. months. And really? that's what we did. And yeah. um, uh, in that time, 
uh, you know, put the songs together for, mm. for uh, Blondell, the, the future Blondell. Album. The Purple album. The Purple album. So you suddenly got a phone call saying that you had another album to do. Was this something you're happy about? You know, you, you, and often you're playing with. Oh them. yeah, I mean it was it was it was brilliant, really. I mean to get. But I mean from that time on, I always thought that, that every album we did would be my last one. Right. There would be no more, which is why we kind of like went shit or bust, if you like. Right. Putting we just dragged musicians in. Well, we've never used one of them. Let's get one of them in, you know. Yeah. We just used to, went over the top with. But again, the, the, the look of Amazing Blondell, you, you had some choice musicians on that yeah. Purple mm. album. It was uh, mm. Paul Rogers, Andy Fraser, yeah. Sue and Sonny, the session singers. Stevie Winwood on Simon, bass. Yeah. Simon Kurt, yeah. Yeah, on, on drums. It, but it, it, it turned into a, a, a project in itself. And again, organic kind of thing. It developed. It did. I mean, that was, a, that was really a joy to do, but I think I basically we were just giving that as a farewell gift, weren't we, mm. from Ireland, because... Uh, Black did it sell well? Well, not really, I think it didn't go, got in the charts for a billboard export charts mm. or something in America. I um, don't think it did particularly well, right. but, uh, and we wondered what the next one was, and Chris, Chris Blackwell heard it and he just said, well, you know, goodbye and good luck, mm. and gave us it and, that, and we left, and that was it. So I thought, what we're supposed to do now? You say, I thought, well, I've got my next one. I've got to be the last one. I mean, in, one in one way, you, you've got to admire Chris Blackwell because he... he oh, was, yeah, I mean, he could have said to, because John... To get back up yeah. on our feet again. Mm. So I mean, before, John was saying so. earlier about, you know, he, he, he took it personally when John left because, you know, but mm. just how, and how much he'd explained to Chris Blackwell, you know, what pressure he was under. Yeah. He could have turned around and said, right, you know, you're all, you know, get lost a lot, you know, mm. you know go and do as you mm. like. But he didn't. At least he gave us, you know... Mm -hmm. He gave us that. Yeah, but, uh, 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 he's a gent. He really is, you know. Mm -hmm. But you see, in those days, people, if somebody A was ill, B had a, you know, a problem in their personal life or anything like that, it wasn't it wasn't regarded as as a valid reason for not mm -hmm. getting out and doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas nowadays, mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. And also, <coughs> we weren't a big enough fish in the sea no. to be able to to warrant the clout with a record company we could say look you know we can't do this because mm -hmm. it just didn't wash but right. if you've got a three-piece band and the lead singer who was also the main songwriter and the front man yeah. and the guy who started it all off and the organizer <laughs> of all the previous gigs is not there any longer well you yeah. you know right. only for him to turn yeah. around and say well come on guys you go write an album and we'll put you right. in the studio show yeah. You know, immense cool. I mean, what would you do if the, one of the bachelors left? Yeah. <laughs> a dance like that. Look, I mean, yeah. if Cluck, well, if the Cluck the actually, Don, Colin Deck and Cluck, if Cluck left the bachelors, <laughs> they'd never work again. <laughs> they? Like Peters and Lee, when they split up, you see, she walked straight into another job and he walked straight into a lamppost. It's just, you can't do it sometimes. <laughs> you need the full unit, don't you? Yeah. So it was the end of an era. John left and you had. One last album, the Purple album, Amazing Bloodbill album, which was a very, very pleasant, it was a different direction, a bit more Fairport Convention, mm. that was that kind of folk, folk rocky than, than archaic. But then that was the, the end of the island era, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. So it's the end of the island era, and uh, it's still Eddie and Ted together as a duo, bringing in various guest musicians. And again, you get a new, another record deal, DGM Records approach you. Yeah, it was quite... Mm. A long time, though, wasn't it, before they did? I think we had a little bit of... A bit of a layoff. A bit of we? a layoff, yeah. Mm. So we just got stuck into writing and, and doing, uh, doing dates, and then we got with DJM, but... Um, what kind of dates were you doing at this point? I can't remember. I think we were just picking up the dates that the, yeah. the threesome left had, had kind of left off, but at the time, and then we started to sort of get... There were a lot of people who were a bit disappointed Mm. Obviously, because they like the threesome. Mm -hmm. But then, we, for a few that did leave, then we got a few that sort of took that place, which gives us a, mm -hmm. a bunch of idiots that we've got will come turn and watch us now. Yeah. <laughs> and how pleased were you with your DGM albums? The, um, I think they were Mulgrave Street. That inspiration. That was okay. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. That was okay. I mean, I think with any you can do. You know, I was thinking mm. you can do better. Yeah. You know, but we we were just. They just got too big, didn't they, sound-wise? I mean, we were bringing, like, a, somebody walked past with a drumstick, would drag him in as they hit something. 
<laughs> John, were you keeping tabs on, on them at this point? Yeah, I, 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 was, I got sort of so far away from the music industry in, in one respect, really. I mean, if people had asked me who, what a certain band was doing, I'd say, who? You know, I didn't really know. You'd had enough. You dropped out for a while. Yeah, I guess I had really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when did you start to get interested again? Well, I did, I did several things. I, I, I started, I had to do something else, so I started guitar teaching. I mean, before that, I did a solo album that, um, that I did with a, an independent record company, and that didn't get a deal. So um, I then started teaching the guitar. I learned to orchestrate. I've got these books on orchestration. You learn to walk straight. <laughs> <laughs> walk straight to the world. And, um, <laughs> and, and I, I orchestrated um, Fantasia Linden for a choir and orchestra and got into that side of things. So I was away from the pop and, you know... Uh, Where was that performed? It was performed uh, a couple of... Uh, three or four places, all local to Lincolnshire. In, mm -hmm towns and in Lincolnshire and um, so, so I did I did that which was quite fun and um, and then uh, after that um, I, I sort of got back uh, to playing a bit in a sort of a Blondel mode uh, as about where, where I left off right. with um, a couple of other guys one guy who'd done the string arrangements on them um, England, Hopkins, yeah, yeah, and he also did string arrangements for um, for the Purple album, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 another guy from Scunthorpe who played guitar called Paul Empson, right. and we we started off doing English music, right. we because we, we had we, we thought well we better have a, a name so we chose English music. And then when when I knew that these guys had packed up as Blondell, we filched that name and used that for right. a while. And so. How long was it that you kept on the Amazing Blondell name before deciding to call it a day about? I think it up to 76, I think. Right. 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 And then again, you also decided enough is enough. You I think it just imploded, didn't it? Just yeah, I mean, out. there was every, every, yeah, it did, it kind of fizzled out, but we, we, there was a different musical thing that was we, was happening. And, and mm. we'd, we'd, rock, yeah, I mean, well, it was, and, 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 and it's, it's the real soul destroying. The audience has stood up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you don't. They decided to stand again acoustic, and don't start dancing Acoustic again. and and sort of melodic music was struggling at that time, wasn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, the punk thing came in and everybody had the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. So we just. You also had a solo album, didn't you? I did. That didn't come out either. We've had a real good run of luck with albums not coming out, haven't well, we? Incredible. Good job though, because it's all on this album. Yeah, it's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the amazing Blondell name was back with you, John, yeah. 77, 78, somewhere around there? Uh, I think it was early 80s, actually. Right. Early 80s, right. I think we did that. Yeah. And then you also decided to call it a day? Well, I, we, we did some gigs, did a little bit of recording. We, we, did a, we did covers of the old Blondell stuff, plus some new things I wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, it went on for a while, but um, I can't remember why it fizzled out. Probably... Um, I mean, I'd been used to doing, to playing on the road. Um, the other two guys hadn't so much. They wanted venues to play in. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Whereas I, I would be quite thing. happy on the white line, <laughs> or on double yellows, I didn't mind playing on the road, it was fine with me. <laughs> funny thing is that we're contemplating covering now some of the, some of the songs that, yeah. that, you, that, yeah. that you did with the other two. Which is just a right. yeah. Well, let's fast forward now to the mid nineties, was it, when you guys decided mm. to get back together again? Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? <sighs> well, we a record company approached us. Mm. Uh, well, first of all, our old vinyl stuff was coming out on CD through a, a record company that had, had licensed them from, their, you know, the various record companies that that Blondell was with at that time, and um, we. That the, they made contact with us, asked us to write some sleeve notes and would we compile mm. a few things. And then a, another record company got in touch with us and said, would you fancy doing a new album? And we thought, I said, well, mm. I, I, I mean, I, I always mm. saw Terry a couple of times a year, but I hadn't seen Ed for absolutely years, literally, had I? No. Didn't recognise him. No. Back in my dark room again, you see. <laughs> and Seth um, had that no, in that. In a dark room, room. that's what it's <laughs> a very dark room. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, so it was me who couldn't watch. Yeah, I was right. 
uh, so we uh, we we did, we said to them right well look we better have a meeting to see if we all want to do it so we we all got together and everybody said well yeah let's give it a shot just for a bit of with no no strings attached one album just do it for a bit of fun and so the record company then guys came up and saw us we um, we fixed what we were going to do and got recording and I mean, we've not played together th no, we as a threesome no. for donkey's years. So we, I just remember the first the first time we did actually play together. We arranged a rehearsal after. We arranged a rehearsal. We've not played together for and it just came, years. It just came back just like that. Yeah. Certainly the harmonies did anyway. It was well, as crap then as it is now. <laughs> it was uncanny, wasn't it? You never lose it, you know. Did you? Uh, like riding a bike. <laughs> it is. Well, you know her as well. Performances as well, of course, yes. Well, yeah, they can... Well, they, they that, that, that just, because we, we had to rehearse so much for the, the, the new album, we decided that um, perhaps we ought to just take it that one step f further and uh, do some live gigs. Well, we hadn't intended to, but people start... Somebody, w mm. when, we, when, we, when we started recording, started up a, a little appreciation society and the word got out and then he, he kept getting letters and emails and stuff mm. saying, Will they do a gig for us? Mm -hmm. And so we got a few gig inquiries like that. And we thought, well, shall we do it? And we thought, yeah, go on, let's have a gig. Because yeah. I mean, a, a year rehearsing and recording, you can't just sort of go there and mm. and, and then just leave it alone again, you know. And how did it go? Where was it? Was it um, high profile? Well, the very first gig. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was. It was at Cherry Burton Village Hall, which was a rather small. <laughs> it, it was actually it, it sort of a like a folk or acoustic music. Club and they moved up to a bigger venue, especially for us for this for this one. Right. But it, it went great. Yeah, we had yeah. a great time. Right. And who was in the audience? Was it was nerve wracking. Amazing Blondell. Oh, old, old fans. Way, right? Yeah, old fans, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was we were really nervous when we, when we yeah. started playing again. Really nervous. And what have you been doing the last couple of years as a band? We keep playing a bit here and there, and um, we've been we've go abroad still. Mm -hmm. Which are your sort of Best hunting grounds, if that's the word. It's got to be Italy, isn't it? Really? Italy. Yeah. <coughs> For yeah. Denmark, Sweden. We eat, no, we eat really well in Italy. Though. We eat yes, well. like to eat there. And you'll go for a weekend festival, or will you go for t a tour, or you, what kind usually of? Usually, sort of small little lightning tours and things like that. It depends. Generally, mostly, we, 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 it's in the summer months. Mm. And it's outdoor festivals nearly all the time there, which is great because I mean the weather's pretty reliable there. Arthritis not into the bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've only been rained off once, haven't we? And that was uh, Terry's fault because he was on a podium above us. You saw. <laughs> Want his fault? <laughs> it just happened at our age. <laughs> and uh, and then um, we, uh, yeah, we, we've we've done a few other countries, but generally they're all just a couple of gigs. Yeah, mm. maybe. English yeah. folk festivals at all? Do you play those? Yeah, yeah I think at Cleethorpes. Yeah, we've, we've played one or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the UK is a funny market, you know, for yeah, us. Um, I mean, we even in the 70s, we did okay in the UK, but we always tend to do better in, in um, Europe, Europe mm -hmm. certainly in, in some of the European countries. And uh, um, actually, the, when we, the first time we went over to America, we, we, we got a really good reaction over there as well. Mm. All right. We played with the Raspberries over in uh, America. Chambers Brothers and the Raspberries and Amazing Rondell. Uh, we played with Badfinger one night. And Badfinger. Mm. It's a very American bill, <laughs> And this presumably is going to happen, you know, as long as, you, as long as you're around. Yeah, it's going to keep on going. As long as we can get wheelchair access, we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're up there. Right. We're out and, there for the duration. And, and with uh, with this new release, John, there's going to be some un unreleased, previously unreleased material coming out for Amazing Blondell Collectors. Well, that's right. There is. Um, there's, uh, I believe, Ed. What's what? What are the bits on uh, of yours that haven't been ever released before? There's a solo album. Isn't there? There's got to be fifty yeah. percent of this. There's a solo yeah. album and some other solo tracks. Some solo tracks, yeah. Some demo right? demo stuff. Um, but I, I mean, as I, I how many tracks by number, I don't know. Yeah. But this is going back to the seventies. This is seventies, eighties, really, yeah. really early, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And then there's there's some there's some stuff pre Blondell, a little bit of stuff pre Blondell. There's some then the solo album that I did is post Blondell. Terry's got several tracks on there that he he wrote. Making love on CV is one of them. So you right. can date that. <laughs> um, 
and uh, they don't have any men anymore. The, there's the, no such thing as a scene. There's a there's there's a there's a, there's a, there's a few. Making love, in fact. <laughs> God, I'm depressed. There's a few uh, English the music, amazing Blondel tracks, new ones that haven't come out, and um, uh, some excerpts of the orchestrated version of Fantasia Linden, mm. which have never been heard before. So it's a real collector's mm. piece. Oh yeah, there's a lot of collector's mm. stuff on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, stuff that. And, and also, there's other versions of stuff that have been played by Blondell before that have never been heard heard before. You know, live things and. Are you still writing together? Are you still yeah. still yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. An album proposed for. Well, I mean, John and I have never really written together as such, apart from just a couple of. We did yeah. we did some writing in the, in the, yeah. the Blondell days together. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's time, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. it's just. It, <clears throat> it's just finding time, what with the, the three gigs that we've got to do this year. <laughs> <clears throat> Where do you find the time, you know? Oh, my pen, in fact. Where do I leave it? <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I, I think eventually we'll get, we'll, we'll get on to another album, but um, it, it, it's, a, it's a case of it, of it just evolving, really. I don't think we're... Oh, we want to see if this record company is still in business after <laughs> we've sent so many down the drain. And we, there may not ever be another I'm record sure couple will, left. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure there will be too. Yeah. John, Ted, Eddie, <laughs> the amazing Blondell, thank you very much for all your English music. Thank you yeah. for the English tea as well. It's been a lovely afternoon here in Lincolnshire. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Has it kicked in yet? <laughs>